The Seven Years' War, or as Americans call it, the French and Indian War, was really the first global conflict. It begins in the Ohio River Valley, but by the time it's done, Britain and France will have fought on practically every continent and every ocean in the world. And Britain emerges triumphant, expelling the French from North America, ending the French Empire here, and this really is the time when Britain will rule the waves. Now, wars are expensive, and the war leaves England quite heavily in debt. Also, with the soldiers and sailors returning, they're looking for work in the industries that had sprung up during the war to supply the British arms now are closing down. So the British Empire is in debt, the economy is shrinking. However, the British Empire does not try to pay its debts by taxing Americans. In 1764, Parliament proposes and passes a Sugar Act that will actually lower the tax on sugar, but Parliament wants to make sure that the tax is collected. Back in the 1720s, Parliament had passed a tax on sugar, that is, importing a barrel of sugar, you would pay nine pence per gallon, but no one had ever bothered to enforce that. You'd have to send someone to collect the tax. Now Parliament lowers the tax on sugar, but is going to send customs enforcers to collect the tax. The purpose is not to pay off Britain's debts by taxing sugar, the real purpose is to make sure that colonists and others who are trading in sugar are actually part of the British trading system. They're really trying to rein in trade or legitimize or regul not regulate in the sense they're going to control it, but just make sure the benefits of all of this accrue to the coffers of the empire. The colonists, particularly those who are engaged in trading sugar, and Boston is an important tr sugar trading port, react differently. They feel they're being taxed without their own consent. They protest this. That is, they've only been taxed by their own assemblies, men they have chosen to represent them. They have never consented to be governed by Parliament. And if Parliament can tax them, what can't Parliament do? So the sugar merchants are the first to protest the Sugar Act in 1764. However, if you're not a sugar merchant, you might have trouble working up a whole lot of sympathy to the very wealthy men who are in the sugar trade. But then the next year, 1765, Parliament passes a new act, the Stamp Act, that is going to affect just about everybody. Playing cards, dice, newspapers, college diplomas, wedding certificates, legal documents are all going to be taxed. And you'll know the tax has been paid because there's going to be a revenue stamp on each item. You're not buying that stamp when you're getting your marriage license, or you don't buy the stamp when you're being handed your college diploma. Whoever is issuing this will have had to buy the stamps. If you want to see a revenue stamp today, look at a pack of cigarettes or a bottle of whiskey. You don't buy that stamp when you buy your cigarettes or whiskey. That's already put there by the manufacturer, and you have the cost passed along to you. The Stamp Act is going to affect everybody. And Bostonians, such as James Otis, who had been protesting the Sugar Act, see this extension of Parliament's power to tax as a larger intrusion into the colonists' power to govern themselves. In the summer of 1765, rumor spreads through town that Andrew Oliver, a local merchant, has been appointed a tax agent and that the taxes are being, the stamps are being stored at his new warehouse on Long Wharf. On the night of August 14th, 1765, a mob descends on Oliver's warehouse, a two-story brick building on Long Wharf. And this group of men, armed with crowbars, axes, and their bare hands, tear the building down and throw the rubble into Boston Harbor. It's their way of protesting the stamp tax. Now there's a big tree in the south end of Boston, just at Boston Neck, where for the years past, uh, men from the south end had gathered for various events. They would gather under the tree, they would hang flags from the tree. This tree was on the road leading into Boston, and so it's a good place to put up messages 
and they would gather putting up messages. And one of their most popular events every year was on November the 5th. This was Pope's Day in Boston, called Guy Fawkes Day in England. Back in 1604 or so, a man named Guy Fawkes and some accomplices had gone into the Houses of Parliament, tried to plant gunpowder in the basement, and blow up Parliament. And they were doing this because Parliament was dominated by Protestants, and these men were all Catholics. And they were trying to do away with this vestige of Protestant power, just as the Protestants were doing, trying to do away with all vestiges of papal power. Guy Fawkes and his accomplices were apprehended. They failed in blowing up Parliament, and they were drawn and quartered, a very painful way of dying. Now, in England, ever after, November the 5th was observed by Protestants as Guy Fawkes Day, with bonfires and effigies of Guy Fawkes, a colorful celebration. Here in Boston, sometime around the late 17th century, Pope's Day begins to be observed. And men from the south end of Boston would gather. They would build an effigy of the Pope. And starting from that tree on the neck of Boston, they would parade through town with their effigy of the Pope. They would have torches. This would be done at night. They would go into taverns demanding to be served. I don't know if you have a group of 20, 30, 40, 50 guys coming into your tavern demanding rum. You'll want to serve them pretty quickly. You probably won't want to charge them because if you do try to get money from them, they might just help themselves and they'll trash your tavern in the way in doing this. So they're going through the south end of Boston, getting progressively more drunk, having a good time. And they also like it if you've bought candles, so you'll illuminate your windows and cut out an effigy of the a little picture of the Pope or a picture of the devil and say, you hate the Pope too, and you light your windows this way, showing your disdain for the Pope. And they will like it if you do that. They'll also like it if you don't do that, because if you don't like what they are doing, they may smash your windows, which also they may enjoy doing. Now, this group is making its way through the south end of Boston, singing songs, waving their torches. Meanwhile, there is another group going through the north end of Boston, and they have their effigy of the Pope. And they're going from tavern to tavern, having a good time, singing their songs, waving their torches. And typically, the two groups will meet up at Dock Square in front of Faneuil Hall. And when they do that, they have a big fight. Each group tries to capture the other one's pope. If the North End group captures the South End's pope, they're going to have a big bonfire right in front of Faneuil Hall burning it. If the South End group captures the North End Pope, they drag it to Boston Common, where they have a big bonfire. So you're combining things that appeal to a certain demographic. Fire, rum, breaking of windows, smashing of property, and very colorful celebration in Boston of Pope's Day every November 5th. Not everyone likes it, of course. Um, if you have your windows smashed, you're not going to be happy with this. And some of Boston's more elite folks think maybe we should do something to rein this mob in. Others say, well, the guys in the mob are dock workers, longshoremen, rope makers, other unskilled workers. Most of the year, they're minding their own business, working hard. Why not let them blow off a little steam on November 5th? Others say, well, do we really want to have mobs of guys parading through the street with their torches, singing songs, destroying property? In the early 1760s, the cart from the south end runs over a 12-year-old boy and kills him. Now, at this point, the le some of the leaders in town, those who think maybe we should tamp down this popular enthusiasm, have the leader of the south end mob, a shoemaker named Ebenezer McIntosh, indicted because he, of course, had organized this parade that had led to the death of this 12-year-old boy who had gotten in the way of the cart carrying the effigy of the Pope. So Macintosh is indicted for manslaughter, put on trial in Boston. And there we have the judge, we have jurors, and we also have several hundred of Macintosh's friends crowding the courtroom. They don't have to say anything. They just look at the jurors. They know where these jurors live. This is a small town. Everyone knows everyone else. McIntosh is found not guilty. No jury in Boston is going to convict Ebenezer McIntosh of anything. 
Now, McIntosh's men were also involved in destroying the Oliver Warehouse. What we see happening in the early 1760s is a growing connection between merchants like John Hancock, who don't want to have to pay their taxes, and this group of men led by Ebenezer McIntosh, the South End Mob. In 1765, when Parliament passes the Stamp Act and we have rioting in Boston, there's a debate in Parliament about what to do about this. Should Parliament now send over a military force to tamp down on this violence? And one member of Parliament, Isaac Barry, protests. He said, they're they're not lawless mobs. They are the freeborn sons of liberty trying to protect their God-given rights as Englishmen. Now, Ebenezer McIntosh knows a good line when he hears one. For years, he's been the leader of the South End mob who causes trouble on Pope's Day. But now he becomes the leader of the Sons of Liberty. And the tree from which they would hang effigies becomes the Liberty Tree. And after August 14, 1765, Mr. Oliver is invited to come down to the Liberty Tree. And when he arrives... There is an effigy of himself hanging from the tree with a noose around its neck, and there is a banner proclaiming death to the Stamp Act. And Mr. Oliver is asked if he wants to resign his commission as a tax agent, and he very wisely says yes, he does. Now, Oliver's brother-in-law is the lieutenant governor, Thomas Hutchinson. Hutchinson's family has been in Boston since the 1630s. His great-great-grandmother was Anne Hutchinson, who had been exiled for her heretical views, according to the Puritan establishment. Thomas Hutchinson, merchant, graduate of Boston Latin and of Harvard College, dedicated public servant. He is the lieutenant governor. He's also the chief justice of the Superior Court. He has also been elected a member of the Assembly. He's also an historian. He is writing a history of Massachusetts Bay. He's published two volumes, and he has in his house all of the manuscripts and documents he is using to write his third volume. And Hutchinson doesn't think the Stamp Act was a wise idea. He thought it would cause too much trouble. On the other hand, Parliament has have the power to pass laws like this. And when his brother-in-law, Peter Andrew Oliver, resigns as tax agent, Hutchinson privately says he thinks he made a mistake. If a mob can force a crown official to resign, what law could be enforced? If people don't like a law, they can just get up a mob and hang an effigy, and the person responsible for enforcing it is going to resign. What kind of government is that? Hutchinson thinks it's government by a mob. Not only does word of Hutchinson's disapproval of Oliver's action spread through town, but also the rumor spreads The whole Stamp Act was Thomas Hutchinson's idea in the first place. On the night of August 26th, Hutchinson is having dinner at his home in the North End with his daughter. Suddenly they hear outside the noise of the mob, a whistle and a trumpet and the sound of men outside. His daughter thinks that maybe they should leave. Why should Hutchinson leave his own house? He's an official. He has been here all his entire life. Not only that, his family has been here for 130 years. Then they hear an axe hitting the front door. They hear the windows breaking, and he and his daughter flee. Fortunately, they have another house in Milton to which he can flee, and the mob ransacks the house. They take his manuscripts and throw them out into the street. They cut the eyes out of his portrait. Actually, some one of his friends said in the wake that the mob apparently did not want to have to suffer another volume of his wretched history. And then things really get going when they find his wine cellar. And the mob ransacks Hutchinson's house, destroys it, showing their disapproval of someone who will disapprove of their actions. We see in this growing power of this mob, the um, Sons of Liberty, as they come to be called, who can exert direct pressure on officials like Hutchinson. And to, uh, it's either to Hutchinson's credit or discredit that he is unbending. He thinks that Parliament has the power to pass the Stamp Act. Apparently, the mob in Boston disagrees, and so do merchants in Boston like John Hancock and others who disapprove of Parliament's actions, and perhaps they are using the mob, or perhaps the mob is pushing them to take more action against the acts of Parliament. So we have in the 1760s in Boston this growing division 
between the established authority, the authority that devolves from Parliament by way of the changing British Empire, and Hutchinson insisting that Parliament has the power to govern, and then the Massachusetts Assembly, which really stands with these rioters in Boston. And I should say that in the spring of 1766, Parliament does repeal the Stamp Act, recognizing that it was too expensive to enforce, that they should find other ways of creating this imperial system, that it simply would be too expensive to do so through a stamp tax. Nonetheless, with the repeal of the stamp tax, the mob has won a major victory.